we uh, go ahead and get started on time, that'll be exciting. Uh, and I promise I won't keep you here uh, too very long uh, with this year's uh, State of the School Address. Uh, I'd like to briefly go through some of the accomplishments we've had as well as some of the challenges that we face and, and talk about some of our, our opportunities. I, I can't help but go back to issues of accreditation because they, they truly plagued us um, for uh, the early part of this, uh, this decade. Um, as everyone knows, we were placed on probation in 2011 with nine standards in non-compliance and one standard in compliance with the need for monitoring and three other standards in transition. And we managed to get through that doing a great deal of work that I think really put us on the right, the right course. Um, we, we've done better since then. Um, I didn't update this for last year's uh, uh, note, but uh, we're pretty much in compliance for, um, for all the standards and uh, I'm confident Bobby is going to get us ready to have a, a really great site visit. Um, and a lot of people worked on this. Um, Bobby Miller, probably more than anyone, uh, Amy Smith, Mike McCarthy, Paulette Weiner, uh, Aaron McGuffin did a terrific job in transition. Uh, Linda Holmes basically got the uh, problems that we had with uh, student debt resolved. Jennifer Plymouth, Shelby Campbell, the list goes on and on. Um, we do have a, another site visit coming up 2018-19. We're in the midst of our self-study now. And again, I'm pretty, pretty confident that we're going to do, do just fine. So, hooray. GME wasn't really in any better shape. Uh, the overall program was on warning, had a number of citations. Uh, some were issues of substance uh, related to central oversight, and some of them were just silly stuff that the, the ACGME cared about very deeply then and frankly stopped caring about since. I don't know if Paul Letts in the audience, but apparently some of the things that we received major citations for, like, like certain um, uh, affiliation agreements uh, and the format that signatures have to be on those affiliation agreements, they've just been dropped completely by ACGME, but it wasn't stopping them from giving us citations. Uh, and uh, this is from a, a few years back, but we're fully uh, accredited and all of our programs are, are accredited without uh, serious citations. And that really speaks to the great work Paulette's done, as well as all the uh, program directors and coordinators in the uh, individual departments that have residencies. Uh, David Bailey's getting lonely, although we are going to get him some help. Um, and our activities with CME continue to uh, uh, be, be consistently accredited, uh, of high quality, and the number of people that we serve keeps going up and up. Since uh, uh, the crisis of accreditation was successfully dealt with. Our, our, uh, the, the word that captures our, our uh, existence, I think, is growth. We've, we've seen a considerable amount of growth in terms of bricks and mortar, in terms of what our practice does, in terms of the educational um, activities that we provide, as well as in our research. And I'm going to talk about each of them uh, a little bit. Um, we've got a number of, of new and, and enhanced uh, uh, or enhanced structures. We've 
gotten some new laboratory space, renovated at Forensics, which we traded in for, for additional space at the Biotech building. We've taken over the Douglas building, which houses Ebenezer and some other things. We've built an office building at Tays Valley, and uh, we've just signed on the dotted line to do the so-called P3 project, which will bring pharmacy to uh, uh, this portion of uh, Huntington and uh, will provide housing for medical students and pharmacy students. I want to spend a couple of minutes on this last point. Um, this really came to be an interest of mine when one of our students was attacked literally a couple of hundred feet from her um, uh, place that she was living. And during daylight, um, you know, just, just walking home from the, the bird bio, uh, from the bird uh, clinical, the Lady Bird building. And uh, we, we looked into different ways to get uh, land to, to do um, this housing project and really came up with, with goose eggs. And, and honestly, I was, I was ready to give up. And then Ronnie May, back when uh, um, Gary White was the, the interim president, came to Kevin Yingling and me with a plan, uh, which is essentially what we're going to ultimately do to use primarily space that we already own, uh, land that we already own, uh, to build these structures. And uh, uh, Ronnie's re just retired, but really it was his his genius that, that came up with a plan that we could actually move, move this forward. I think that's, that's very exciting. Uh, this P3 project has had its, its struggles even with this great idea of Ronnie's. Um, Leighton Cottrell and Brian Gallagher and certainly Kevin Yingling have been really instrumental in, in pushing this through. If we just look at the economics of the School of Medicine over the last five years, you'll see a very telling story. Um, the top blue line is practice plan revenue. The green line below that is hospital contracts for, for clinical services. And you can see they're on the increase, and we're going to talk more about that in a moment. Everything else is flat or decreasing. Um, there's been a change coming, going forward for next year with grants and contracts, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But we need to remind ourselves that we are in the business of providing clinical care. In, in fact, over the last um, five years, we've had a 57% increase in clinical revenue um, generated, frankly, by only a 20% increase in our clinical faculty. So everybody's working harder, and, and because of our hard work, uh, the practice plan is doing well, the hospital is doing great, and we've been able to support a number of the enterprises that we're, we're going to talk about. Um, Joe Wordhammer did a terrific job when he was CMO and continues to do a great job. Buffy Hammers is the best practice plan CEO I've met. And Larry Dial has just been spectacular replacing Joe as, as CMO. We haven't missed a step. Matt Straub does great work as our CFO. And Jim Becker does a great job interfacing with the governmental agencies that we have to deal with some of whom actually get around to paying us eventually, although never as quick as we like. Jim, I don't know if you want to make comments on that. Probably not, right? Yeah. If you look at our clinical productivity by department, it's a, it's a pretty simple and consistent story that pretty much all of our departments float on their own bottoms. Um, that blue line going uh, horizontal is the 100% mark for the median of MGMA. 
and and you can see that virtually every department now has activities in their department normalized for that specialty uh, that is above and in many cases is substantially above that median and that frankly is why we're here to talk about all the fun stuff that we want to do this is the engine that, that makes it possible um, we've added a number of new programs that have been revenue positive and have been good for patient care. Uh, 340B Pharmacy, which has been spectacularly successful, uh, owes uh, its existence to Brian Gallagher, Kevin Yingling, um, Gene Preston, and, and others at the hospital, but it's really been a wonderful thing for us. Um, we offer after-hour clinics um, not just in pediatrics now, have a number of new clinical programs. And I, I really, really gasp when I think about some of the opportunities that this hospital merger is going to bring about. And we'll, we'll talk more about that, that later. We have a number of affiliations. Um, and Paulette has been successful in developing a consortium uh, that links several of the other agencies uh, in this region together and hopefully it's something we can explore extending to, to other hospitals that have either uh, a virgin state with caps or have room for additional cap space because of their rural nature. Our graduate school um, has had some expansion. We've, in, we've reinvigorated our MD-PhD program. We're now offering a Master's of Science in Clinical Translational Science. We're increasing the BMS program. And it's, it's our hope to add a PA program. We're going to submit an intent to plan um, a request to our Board of Governors this next meeting. A uh, number of people have been involved with this, including Bobby Miller, but I want to also point out that Uma Sundaram has been instrumental in, in a lot of this graduate school growth. Well, taking a step back, um, we periodically ask our students, our residents, and our faculty how we're doing. And on last year's, uh, well, this is the last uh, eight years, but, but last year in particular, our students felt that we were doing pretty good. Um, we actually got our satisfaction curve above the, the national average. And the national average is a pretty, pretty high number. Most medical students around the country are pretty pleased with their medical education. Um, if you look at our breakdown, we're pretty much above the national average in almost all of the uh, preclinical uh, um, areas and in most of, but not all, of the clinical areas. And this really speaks very well of, of the great things that Bobby Miller and, and Amy Smith have done um, with our med ed uh, department. Um, there's been a concentrated effort to improve in all areas from departments to blocks. Um, we, we did better with the students in terms of getting them to complete the GQ as opposed to ignore it, uh, as well as to understand what this graduation questionnaire means. But mostly I think our engagement with our students uh, continues to get better and better and, and really uh, the lion's share of the credit has to go to Bobby and Amy for making that happen. If we look at the performance of our students on their licensing exams, step one, step two CK and step two CS which they take during medical school, uh, you can see that we're now above the national uh, average in terms of pass rate in, in all of them. And uh, although there's some fluctuation uh, from year to year, um, the trend is positive and, and we, we take this very seriously because if we can't get our kids to pass the licensure exams, 
they can't become practicing physicians. So it's a, a very important, you know, we can argue about whether we should be teaching to the test, but this is a very important test because if you don't pass it, you can't do what it is we want doctors to, to do. Our, our GME uh, activities have also been uh, expanded considerably. Um, we've gone from about 150 uh, GME positions to well over 200 um, uh, positions now. Um, we've got new fellowships in Hemonc, um, psych residencies in psychiatry, fellowships in psychiatry, uh, fellowships in sports medicine, nephrology, new dental residency, and new uh, neurology residency. And uh, a lot of credit has to go to uh, the people in the departments that have pushed through these different programs. Um, Marissa for Hemonc, um, Suzanne for psychiatry, Steve uh, Petrani for sports medicine, Ziad Keton for nephrology, Raj Khanna for dentistry, and Paul for, for uh, neurology. The only thing you have to pick up out of this is the blue diamonds are higher than the yellow bars. Uh, on balance, in all uh, aspects of evaluation, our residents are uh, more, are happier with different aspects of our, our residencies than comparable residents at other programs. And that's, that's really nice to see. Um, it's also nice to see that our board pass rates are um, hovering uh, between 80, 80 and 100%. And uh, with an occasional dip here and there, uh, we stay out of trouble by maintaining uh, a good, a good five-year rolling average for our, our board pass rates. Um, I didn't show you a slide on this, but um, at some point we'll have additional discussions of the faculty um, survey, and, and frankly, I'll keep my hands off of that so it stays. Uh, pristine, but I will say that uh, on balance our faculty are more satisfied with working here at the uh, Marshall University School of Medicine than comparable faculty at other institutions. Research funding has had a nice bump um, based on the activities of uh, Gary Rankin, Uma Sundaram, Zijin Shea, and, and others. And uh, next year, we will see a, a bump in the contribution to our uh, overall finances uh, from research. Uh, the number will go from about 10 million a year uh, to probably closer to 17 million per year. Um, this is an activity that requires a lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, and accepting a lot of disappointment because the Funding percentiles for, for grants from our major funders is, well, those percentiles are, those pay lines are pretty low. So as a practicing scientist, I can tell you that you get used to sending in a few grants in the hope of getting one funded. Although UMA seems to get them all funded, I'm really trying to figure out what combination of alcohol and drugs will get them to share the secret with me how you, you get them funded. Yeah. Or is there, is there require money? I, I don't know. Most things do. Um, but, but with all kidding aside, we have had uh, uh, some significant improvements in, in, in our research footprint. Don't get too happy about this. We, we have a ways to go um, before uh, uh, we're going to be viewed as a, as a national uh, uh, threat in this area, um, but it is very positive to see the growth that we've been able to get. Uh, I mentioned it on a later slide, but, but Gary Rankin has been spectacularly successful with some of his recent recruitments, 
that I think are going to do really well for us going, going forward. Um, it's not an accident. We've put a lot of time and energy into this. We've put a lot of money into pilot grants. Uh, we've done combination pilot grants with WVU. Um, we've come up with ways to uh, support crosstalk with our uh, College of Pharmacy. Uh, we've tried to direct some uh, margin from clinical ventures to enhance research and scholarship. And, and frankly, we've done a lot of things to try to, to improve our, our profile with research. Um, if you look at the top clinical entities in the country, they all have very strong research programs. It's not immediately obvious why one is necessary for the other, but it is. If you don't have active research and you don't have active educational programs, it's really, really hard to have first-rate clinical services. And that's a lesson that I think that we've, we've really embraced over the past uh, half decade. If you look at our scholarly output, um, it's essentially doubled or tripled uh, since uh, 2010, 2011, i.e. before the, the LCME citation. Um, this number is a hard number to get at because it's hard to get our faculty to log into the system and put in their, their papers. Um, but they do eventually, and I'll bet you the 2017 numbers actually go up steadily over this year as people get around to, to filling it out. Uh, the number I'm showing for 2016, uh, you know, grew a bit last year, so I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised by that. I've had a number of notable achievements. Uh, we've had some papers published in major scientific journals. I should not brag about this so early, but we just heard that uh, one of our papers is getting into one of the Nature journals. I just got the letter today. I'm pretty happy about that. Um, we got a COBRA grant, which is really exciting. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Gary Rankin's been incredibly successful with some of his recruits, as has uh, Uma. Um, we've had sustained growth of the clinical enterprise solid board pass rates. This last year, we had 100% of our first time takers pass step 2 CK, which I think is really exciting. Um, we do well with the match. Um, student resident satisfaction is on the incline and is above the national average. Good faculty satisfaction. Uh, we do a number of other good things. And I want to do a quick shout out to, to uh, Darsh for her work with the Marshall Journal of Medicine, which is really becoming um, a significant, significant journal. Um, we're now at just about 25,000 international downloads. I mean, that's really pretty, pretty remarkable. And I'm confident Darsh will be able to get us PubMed cited in the next, uh, uh, well, sometime in the future, hopefully soon. Okay, we face some challenges. If you look at US News and World Report, and this is where people should start booing, we're really not, we're not only are we not likely to be, be considered one of the top schools by their standards, but we're not even close. Uh, out of 124 schools that, that, that comply with their, their uh, survey, uh, we rank in research at 103 and primary care at 101. Now, some of that, frankly, is the things that are used for comparison and how they aren't necessarily what we would use. Uh, let me give you a concrete example. 
Um, I think using research grants as a, as a yardstick for research rankings is reasonable. And, and the bigger schools are just going to be bigger. Um, uh, Hopkins has a thousand people in their department of internal medicine. Um, it's, it's, it's a different ball game at some of these large places. However, my real issue is the use of entry criteria as a way of comparing the excellence of the different schools. If your kids have higher MCATs and your kids have higher GPAs, this actually is used as points for your school in these rankings. And the fact of the matter is, and I, and I don't apologize for this one bit, nor do I think any of us should, I'm really proud of the fact that at Marshall, we take kids who don't have such great MCATs and don't have such great GPAs and make them into excellent doctors. I think that speaks really well of our medical school and isn't something that should count against us. If you just look at the rate at which we graduate people who are going into primary care, we rank 18 out of 124, so at least we got that little bullet point on the US News and World Report rankings. When I think about economic challenge, I think about the following. Most schools have established something closer to a tripod with about a third grants, a third practice, and about a third everything else. That's not us. We are heavily, heavily based on our clinical practice. And we're very susceptible to changes in how clinical care is reimbursed. Um, it's not an unusual problem. Other medical schools would say the same thing, but state support is evaporating and it will be de minimis at some point in the future. On the flip side, trying to make up for it with tuition is problematic. It's something our accrediting body frowns on, but more importantly, I think it's antithetical to our core mission of training doctors to practice in this region. If our kids graduate with enormous debt, how are we going to get them to do primary care in, in you know, uh, Gilbert? I mean, it's just not, it's just a non-starter. We have to find some way to, to make medical school continue to be affordable. And, and Linda Holmes has done an amazing job at increasing our scholarships to, to address that particular challenge. Again, if you, you look at our, our pie graph, uh, it's a different pie graph than the rest of the medical schools. Uh, the practice plan and the hospital together uh, account for, you know, 80% of our revenue, where it's really more like uh, not even two thirds for um, for other for other institutions. Um, the state support is pretty low everywhere, and tuition support is appropriately low because that doesn't really capture what goes into a, a, a allopathic medical school. We're a medical school focused on training primary care doctors, and I think that's wonderful, and I'm very proud of that. But we're still not ranked for primary care. Uh, some of that is the way ranking agencies rank schools. Some of it is getting the word out about the great work that we're doing. Along those lines, I can't think of a medical school that does a better job training docs for rural medicine but we're still not ranked for rural medicine. Again, it's a matter of getting the word out so that people appreciate what we're doing. I believe our medical school gives our students great preparation for residency, um, but bluntly, we're not on the map, nor are we gonna be on the map uh, in research, even in areas where we're truly leaders. 
So this is the kind of stuff I have to deal with when I go home. Mary Shapiro takes this week's issue of JAMA, circles an editorial on neonatal abstinence syndrome, and says, where's our article? Right? And what's really interesting is if you read this editorial, the authors get it all wrong. They don't see neonatal abstinence syndrome at the hospital that they're writing this editorial review at. And they claim the incidence of NAS ranges between 6 and 20 per thousand live births. Bobby, is that right? Okay. We'll talk a little bit about some of the opportunities. I think the merger of uh, our Huntington hospitals will produce unprecedented opportunities to develop new service lines and new programs. I think we can develop programs in organ transplantation, develop new CV services, and frankly, in the context of our ACO that we formed, develop new paradigms for coordination of care. Um, coordination of care in the Medicaid world or, or other governmental payers with capitated projects has an enormous potential reward with, frankly, an enormous risk. Um, the, the state Medicaid budget is something north of $4 billion a year, and I have to think that there's a way to, to do better with that money than we currently do, uh, but the fact of the matter is um, you better be right about being able to control costs. Um, I'm not going to bore you with these graphs. They simply show that whatever payer we're talking about, most of the action is in a small subset of the payers. In the case of Medicaid, 3% of our population generate 50% of our charges. For Medicare, it's more. You've got to go out to about 15 16% to get to 50%, but it's still a minority, and we have to learn how to manage the costs of care for those people, or else we're not really going to address the overall cost. We have a historical association with the VA, which has grown stronger over time, and, and recently um, UMA received a VA merit review, which I hope will be just one of, of several in, in the future. We have excellent partnerships with Cabell Huntington Hospital, now to be merged with St. Mary's Medical Center, and this has yielded tremendous benefits to both Cabell Huntington and the School of Medicine. Um, just recently, we announced the formation of a historic accountable care organization combining um, Cabell Huntington Hospital, um, Marshall Health, and HIMG together in the care of our seniors. And I think that's just the beginning of some of the synergisms we can do within this region. Some reason my slide got a little bit cut off here, and I lost Mike Perry on the edge. Give me a second. Okay, that's a little better. As I mentioned, we are now experiencing the historic combination of our major teaching hospitals, and this this has been an incredible achievement. Um, as most of you in the audience know. This is something that was opposed very strongly. The, the Federal Trade Commission got involved. We had to get new legislation from our state, and we had to pay lawyers lots of money for a long time to make this happen. This merger was the vision of many people, including Steve Kopp. And, and frankly, I remember Steve Kopp um, uh, instigating for discussions that could lead to this, this merger um, 
pretty much from when, when I came here and probably happened before. The actual merger involved the work of many people, but I want to call out that, that Brent Marsteller and, and uh, Mike Sellers truly acted as statesmen and, and put aside their, their you know, proprietary interests in their hospitals and worked together to, to make this happen. Uh, Gary White was instrumental in pushing this along, as was Mike Perry, who served as a sounding board for everybody involved. It really is a village that made this happen. Um, and I think it's important we, we remember uh, to whom we, we should, you know, uh, feel some gratitude. Right, I'll see if I can do this without screwing up. Um, I think we have additional educational opportunities. I'd like to see us continue to expand our medical school proper. Uh, I'm thinking that a target of ultimately 90 to 100 students per year will be possible without losing the great small class feel that we have here at Marshall. Um, like many things, and I'll get back to that, this is an extension of what Dr. McCown was, was doing uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years of his, uh, of his deanship. We want to continue to expand our GME programs. Um, we have a new program in neurology. I hope that when we get uh, Dan Langleben here, we'll, we'll develop a fellowship in addiction medicine. Uh, and ultimately will expand into radiology, anesthesiology, neurosurgery, et cetera. Um, I know that our folks in the graduate school are looking to expand our MS programs and ultimately interface with our BS programs, but the watchword for all of this has to be excellence. We have to offer the very, very best training that people can get uh, in order to be successful. In medical education, our curriculum continues to evolve both in the medical school and in the graduate school. I'm really pleased that, that Bobby, along with, with uh, uh, Mike and Nitten and others, use uh, predictive analytics to proactively identify students early that are struggling and provide intervention, as well as doing ongoing review of performance. Um, I think we have to continue to increase our research opportunities. Um, some of the master's programs are becoming more research intensive. Uh, we'll continue to develop new pilot grant funding, and we need to get more federal grants uh, that are related to the disease population that we serve. They're, they're hard to get, but candidly, that's the name of the game. It's almost impossible, no, it is impossible to do good biomedical research these days without extramural funding. It just can't be done any other way. Um, and fortunately, we're, we're having success at, at improving our, our footprint and improving those, those grants. We've got a very proud origin as a school created specifically to serve the underserved portion of West Virginia. And, and we've got a wonderful history under the leadership of Dr. McCown at the medical school. And I gotta point out Brent Marsteller with Cabell Huntington Hospital. Um, the school and the hospital enjoyed tremendous growth and tremendous um, uh, improvements in, in quality, which, which, can t which we build on now, but if we didn't have that foundation, uh, we wouldn't be talking about what we're talking about. Uh, we, we, we really owe Dr. McCown and Mr. Marsteller a, a, a great debt. Um, we face grave challenges going forward, but we also have unprecedented opportunities, which I believe will enable us to continue our noble mission and expand our impact. So, MUSON is as critical to the region as it is effective at its noble mission. Growth in all aspects of our mission have, it's been remarkable. 
We face a number of challenges, um, but the Chinese character for crisis is a combination of danger and opportunity. So I think on that level, we're exactly where we, we want to be. Thank you all for your attention. Any questions or comments? Stun silence. Sasha, thank God. Uh, there, there are, and, and in fact, um, maybe I, Dr. Rankin, you're here, aren't you, somewhere? Yeah, Gary, maybe you want to comment. Well, I think one thing we're trying to do is first try to fill the voice of the board. As you know, we continue to have the power Those of us that came in back in the dark ages of the Let, let me expand on that, um, but first say that neither you nor Sasha are allowed to retire. Okay? Um, we have to continue to become more successful at obtaining research grants. It's not something we can push aside and go, okay, well, forget about that for a minute. Let's hire some more people. You can't. The NIH thinks it pays 55% of medical schools, basic science, faculty salaries across the country. We can't operate at 10% national you know, funding on extramural grants and be competitive with these schools that are 50, 60, 70% funded on grants. It's just a non-starter. And, and, and to that end, Gary has put a tremendous amount of effort and energy into identifying people that are really going to be good bets to have funding in the future. And one of the best predictors is whether they're funded now. Past behavior predicts future behavior. Along those lines, though, UMBA's COBRA grant is huge for us because it gives us a pipeline of funded investigators. And when these investigators that are supported on the COBRA grant graduate and get an R01 grant, UMA can slip in another junior investigator, put them essentially in an R01 funded kind of milieu, and work to graduate them. Uh, so I think that we're, we're, we're really getting our ducks in a row uh, to uh, uh, do some damage, if you will. I think that we can become a, a stronger force. We're, ne we're never going to be the Massachusetts General Hospital. We're never going to be Johns Hopkins. But I would love to see us creep towards um, a two-digit ranking in research on the NIH scale. Uh, we're currently 122, although Uma tells me with the COBRA grant we're now in the teens the one teens, uh, if we can get to the point where a certain fraction of our basic science faculty are funded, then we can start tackling getting 
clinical scientists funded in the clinical departments and expand our purview even further. Because we have something the rest of the world doesn't. We've got an incredible teaching laboratory with the patients that we serve. Really unique. And, and, and I think if we continue to grow the way we are, we'll actually be able to take advantage of that. Uma, do you have any comments you want to make? But as I said earlier in the talk, we have to remember it's the clinical engine that makes this all possible. We can't afford to, 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 to miss a beat on that. Um, on that note, Larry, do you have any comments you want to make? Yeah, most centers have not been successful at marrying a, a population management to a fee-for-service mentality. We're, we're going to have to do something that other places haven't been able to. Well, I thank everybody for their attention and uh, have a great evening.